Now, the interesting question is how did Apple and those startup personal computer companies, how did they change the future? Well, Apple had this great benefit when they got their start, which was that they had no customers. So they got to ask the simple question, wonder who would want a personal computer? Do you remember who they sold the first personal computers to? Anyone? I think I heard it there. Schools, Schools even before that, was children, direct, right? Children and hobbyists who were clear non-consumers, and schools were next, right? Because they couldn't afford these big uh, mini-computer uh, machines for a quarter million dollars, but a couple thousand bucks gave them access to computing. And so this wasn't a crummy machine that could barely do word processing at all. It was awesome. They were able to do computing, and they got start there and improved year over year over year and changed the world. Now, we've seen disruptive innovation literally change sector after sector. Uh, I've put up here in the blue column the list of uh, companies whose stock we wish we had owned in the prior couple decades. <laughs> and they've literally been disruptive to those organizations in red who in their own right were once disruptive themselves. Now, What's interesting about the list is you see it's not just for-profit companies. We see nonprofit, we see government and regulated industries. It's, it's across a range of things. Um, and so we can literally go line by line and tell a similar story of, uh, of disruptive innovation transforming a sector. If you went uh, on that first one, it's well known by now, but Toyota and the Japanese automakers over the last many decades had uh, disrupted the Detroit automakers, right? Now, the interesting question is how did uh, Toyota get its start? They didn't start at the high end uh, with the high-flying Lexuses that I'm sure all of you drove to Columbus this morning. Um, they started, if people remember, in the 1960s at the low end with this crummy car called a Corona. Anyone own a Corona? Okay, apologies in advance, um, but I think I saw you're a product manager, so you, you yeah, this. <coughs> so, my, my wife's a product manager, so guys, always treat product managers nicely is the uh, takeaway. But, um, but they started with this Corona, which rusted kind of quickly. It wasn't that great, but compared to the gas guzzling cars that Detroit was trying to shove down everyone's throats, these things allowed people that were going to have some trouble buying a car to have an automobile. And they got their start there, and then true to form, they got better and better year over year. From the Corona to the Tercel, Corolla, Camry, Forerunner, Avalon, and then the Lexus. And literally changed the world. Now, to be fair to the managers at, uh, in Detroit, at GM and Ford, uh, they saw these guys coming. And every once in a while they said, you know, we really ought to go out there and compete with those buggers. And so they'd send down a Pinto or a Chevette But when they compared the margin of selling one of those vehicles with the unmitigated blessing of being able to push out yet another Cadillac, Escalade, or Ford Explorer, it just didn't make any sense, right? So they'd retreat back up market, seed more ground, and by the time the story was really up, we, we know how that played itself out. They literally have reinvented their companies through bailouts and bankruptcy. Now, interestingly enough, Toyota has been being disrupted over the last several years. Until recently, they did not feel it because they had the privilege of stealing market share from Mercedes-Benz at the high end. But does anyone know who's been uh, disrupting them over the last several years? Hyundai, Kia, the, the Koreans, right? Yeah. Uh, not being too shy about it either. <clears throat> this is a commercial that Hyundai uh, has been running where they say, isn't it time someone did to Lexus what Lexus did to Mercedes? coming right at them, taking dead aim, right? They own the subcompact and compact ends of the market. And look, 10 years ago, we sort of made fun of the quality of the Koreans' cars. Now they're winning all the quality awards. Interesting how that plays itself out. We've seen it in retail. Used to be 300 plus uh, full service department store chains across this country. Now uh, discount retail, Kmart, Walmart, Target, uh, transformed that, that starting in the 1960s. If you've noticed closely, Target has transformed itself again through a sustaining innovation to become Target. <laughs> it's true. <clears throat> and online retail is now coming up underneath that to disrupt it. What's interesting is any, anyone know who runs Target.com? 
I think I heard it. Am well, Amazon does. Um, Amazon powers Target.com completely. Go, go check it out, and you'll see actually now that I've said that, the skinning. Uh, is, it's, it looks like Amazon. <laughs> um, so really interesting how that plays out. And we'll start to turn to education here um, in a moment. But I'm not sure you'd say community colleges were necessarily disruptive, but they were certainly decentralizing. They allowed many, many more people to get a post-secondary education. Uh, and you didn't have to go to the flagship state university in the middle of the state for the higher price. Uh, about 50% of Americans now get their education, actually, higher education at community colleges. And the real disruption has been online universities. As the rest of higher education is kind of shrinking or just sort of trucking along, online universities are growing roughly 20% a year. And I'm sure you've seen sort of the next wave of what I would characterize disruption in that market, which is the rise of the MOOCs, massively open online courses. Uh, places like MITx, now called edX, Udacity, Coursera, these things coming out that are going to redefine higher education yet again. And it's going to be really interesting to see which of these stick around. Um, so before I dive into the full force of K-12 education and how you all are leading some of the uh, disruptions that we see coming out, um, what I thought I would do is just say one other thing about what organizations do when they see a disruptive innovation start to come in their midst, why they struggle so much to grab hold of it. And for this story, I want to walk back uh, a considerable amount of time in the 1950s and 60s and think about the consumer electronics industry. And if you went back to that time in uh, consumer electronics, uh, you would see that most of them were powered by what we call vacuum tubes. If people remember vacuum tubes, they were about the size of your fist. They blew out every once in a while. But they enabled unbelievable technological marvels for the time, such as tabletop radios and floor standing televisions made by companies like RCA and Zenith and so forth. And um, what was interesting was RCA and, and so forth in, in this era, they were doing some great stuff, these great technological marvels. And in 1947, out of Bell Labs, scientists there invented this really exciting thing called a transistor. And the transistor was the first foray into solid state electronics. And all of the folks at RCA, Zenith, and so forth, they saw the transistor and said, that's an exciting technology. I bet it's going to change the world. And so they took a license to it. And then they did something familiar, which was they put it into their labs and began doing research and development on it, R&D. And they spent lots of money to perfect the transistor. Basically framing the problem as if we spend enough money on perfecting the transistor, we'll just swap it in for our vacuum tubes inside of our core business. And our customers will have no idea the difference. And uh, we'll just keep on going on minting money. The challenge was that the technological hurdle that that existed at the time was so high that despite investing over a billion dollars adjusted for today's money by RCA alone, they never got it such that they could just simply swap in the transistor for the vacuum tube. It just never made any sense. Even today, uh, vacuum tubes are used in, in very small applications for the military where transistors still aren't good enough. Now, the transistor, though, of course, did transform the world. But it didn't start in that blue plane back there. It started out in this green one of non-consumption. And the first application for the transistor appeared in 1952 in the form of the hearing aid. Now, this was an application made for the transistor because a vacuum tube was totally impractical <laughs> for the transistor for many years, excuse me, for the hearing aid for many years. And this was a device that didn't need a lot of power with a transistor that couldn't handle a lot of power. So it was just a marriage made in heaven. Got it start there. And in 1955, this thing came out out of uh, Japan called the Pocket Transistor Radio by this company no one had heard of called Sony. And when they did hear of them, they didn't think much of them. Because quite frankly, those early transistor radios were kind of crummy. They were staticky. The fidelity wasn't all that great. 
Clay Christensen grew up in Utah. He had to face west if he wanted to get a signal on the thing. But Sony had this really interesting insight, which was we're going to sell this thing to the low end of humanity, people we today call teenagers. <laughs> and teenagers will be just delighted with this quote unquote crummy product because from their perspective, it won't be crummy at all because they can't afford those tabletop radios. And for them, it costs just a couple bucks, and now they can drop this thing inside of their shirt pocket, run out of the earshot of their parents, and listen to their rock and roll music. So this was actually not a crummy device at all, but a great device. And it got better and better and better, and by 1959, Sony came out with a portable television. Now again, compared to these floor-standing TVs that were massive, this, this wasn't all that great. But for people that didn't have the apartments and the pocketbooks to be able to afford the floor standing televisions, this was a great device. And true to form, it got better and better and better, year over year over year. And by the late 1960s, all the vacuum tube companies' businesses literally vaporized as people rushed out into the screen plane because they were delighted with these products that were way more uh, affordable, convenient, accessible and so forth. And by the way, reliable, because they didn't blow out every once in a while like the vacuum tubes did. And it transformed the world. Now, this is a really punishing story, right? Because RCA saw the transistor well before Sony did. They invested way more money than Sony ever did. But it wasn't a problem of money, and it wasn't a problem of technology. And when we frame these things as a technology problem, we tend to be missing the picture. The challenge was that Sony was able to build an entirely new model around the transistor that could prioritize it, that made sense with these new customers, that didn't see these things as crummy at all. Whereas RCA crammed the transistor into its core operations, trying to replace it as a technology problem, never reinventing the model itself. And that's what I really want to leave you with this slide, is that the model matters way more than the technology. The model and how it's used matters way, way more. And it's absolutely critical. And what we've seen if we're switching to education now is that for too long, our schools and the philanthropies and governments around them in particular framed a lot of education technology in the same way we framed the vacuum tube which was to cram it on top of our existing classrooms, to layer it on as an add-on. We'd shove three computers in the back, say, hey, you can do some word processing, hey, make a PowerPoint presentation, but never fundamentally changing the model of education itself. And so all of us who believe in the power of technology to support the learning processes, to support teachers, to create great environments for students, would have to admit that we spent well over $60 billion equipping our schools with computers and had very little effect. Now, what I'd like to say is that really what we did for a long time was just sustain the chalkboard. It's just a lot of sustaining innovations. We had the chalkboard, we introduced whiteboards, we had electronic whiteboards, but we still kept the dominant model of all eyes on me at the top and we're all gonna go lockstep together. And by the way, there were a bunch of other devices that sustained it as well. <laughs> um, but fundamentally, we didn't actually change the model itself. And I, I think that's starting to change. I, over the last several years, really the last decade, we've seen online learning in K-12 education start to have the same impact we would see in other fields. And it represents a huge opportunity for transformation. Let me talk first about how it's transforming delivery, and then we'll talk about the models we can put in place to really make sure it creates something better.